Okay. Welcome everybody um, to the Raytown School Board meeting. Uh, entertain a motion to call the meeting to order. All right, I'll call the meeting to order at 6.30. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, let's get the meeting started. Let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have uh, the approval of the May 10th, 2021 agenda. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the board approve the May 10th, 2021 agenda. Second. A motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. All right, next we'll have uh, the report of any board members. Mr. President. Mr. President, oh. Mr. President <clears throat> I attended the uh, ribbon cutting at the culinary building the other night or the other day. And um, having seen that building from the outside, it's impressive. But having seen it from the inside, it is really impressive. That kitchen and the, the dining area and, and then the students all working back there cooking and doing what they're we're doing to prepare the uh, stuff for us. It was uh, very nice, very impressive. And um, we've got a facility that should be second to none. I'd like to add that the the food was spectacular. I'd probably choose to go there over any restaurant in town. And so was the service. It was, it was a great time. Mr. President. I uh, attended the retirement shindig. It was truly a shindig. It was a really nice event. Um, there were about nine retirees and they uh, had a great time as it appeared and the event was very nice. Yes, it was. And uh, anyone else? Yes, I missed the the shindig because I was able to go to the Raytown High band concert that same night, and um, it was just good to hear music live and in person. And so the directors have done a great job this year with um, the circumstances that happened with only being able to practice with half the band at a time. And I know Raytown South was the same night, so I missed theirs. I'm sorry, but um, I'm just really proud of all of our fine arts teachers and the job they've done this year. All right. Well, I would like to add um, that I will be uh, trying to communicate with each board member. Uh, I know we haven't done uh, the committee assignments yet. Um, just to get some input on uh, what you guys, uh, what committees you want to be on or stay on. And also, uh, want to uh i'll probably you'll be receiving some an email from me individually about uh just want to get started trying to draft our our board goals and uh i'll speak more to that later but um just want to some ideas that i had and want to make sure that uh i get the input of all the all the board members and so that we can uh achieve our set our goals and achieve those as well So next on the agenda is the report of superintendent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, legislative update, as you know, it's been a long, hard, difficult session and it's not over. This is the last week in the Missouri General Assembly. Uh, hundreds of education bills this year 
there have been a record number of education choice bills that have been filed. Now, for the past 12 years, the education choice organizations have been trying to pass some type of education scholarship account slash tax credit voucher bill. Finally, this week, they were successful in passing such a bill in House Bill 349. As reported earlier, this bill passed out of the House with the bare minimum vote needed of 82, and then Thursday, the Senate, by a vote of 20 to 13, passed the bill and sent it to the governor's desk. Now, throughout this session, the lobbying groups were able to keep this bill from coming to a vote because they had 17 senators in opposition to this bill. As you know, the Senate contains 34 members, and to pass any bill in the Senate, you need 18 votes. We were able to keep that from happening uh, in Jefferson City until this week when the Senate leadership was able to secure three votes from Republican senators who were earlier a no vote. Now, in, in short uh, order, uh, let me give you kind of an idea of what that bill looks like. Uh, it is a, actually a watered down bill of their, their earlier bills but of past legislative sessions, but it's a $50 million tax credit, which has a maximum cap of 75 million. It only affects students have an, who have an IEP or those who are on free and reduced lunch. Again, it will only apply to students in counties with a charter form of government or any city with at least 30,000 in their population. It also has a provision that puts a minimum floor of 40% of the projected amount necessary to fully fund public transportation state aid for school districts. So in other words, they have to reach 40% funding for it to kick in. And in the past, they barely hit in the neighborhood of 25, but this year they're gonna hit their 40. Also, uh, it has a provision that should a student leave their resident district to participate in this program, that student shall continue to be counted for state aid purposes for five years within the district. Now, 349, whether it's watered down or not, we think it's bad public policy because there's really no uh, school, private schools, uh, uh, home schools. They are not monitored by the state. Uh, there's no accountability. Uh, and yet we're sending tax money that direction. So we have another week to go. Uh, the governor still has to sign it. We are trying to uh, convince the governor that he needs to veto this bill just because of the accountability issues alone. Uh, but there are other bills that are still out there and in the last week, anything can happen. So I'll keep you posted on that. And if, with that being said, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Is there a, a possibility that the governor will a veto that I had I, I uh, emailed him today encouraging him to veto it but uh, yeah. uh, is there a, a remote chance that he'll do that well they're saying there is a chance but we got to understand he is he is from the rural area uh, those things that they put on the inside the bill to make it more palatable one uh, how many how many school districts are affected by 30,000 people in their city? Not very many. Those and also first class counties. Mm -hmm. Those focus on the metropolitan area, St. Louis, Kansas City and Springfield. Uh, him having those rural roots, we don't anticipate him necessarily with it not impacting them of signing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over some of these unless you have questions in the report of elementary principles or secondary principles uh, and 6.4 uh, OSS ISS a monthly data review to give Dr. Shelton time for his preliminary uh, budget review. Thank you, Dr. Merkley. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, everyone. Um, Melissa, if you would, if you please open up that document. The FY preliminary budget uh, has been in the works for a number of months. Uh, the budget development process consists of four phases. Uh, the budget requested phase, the budget proposed phase, the budget approved phase, and the budget adopted phase. We're currently in the budget approved phase, so that third phase of the budget development process. Uh, to get to this point in the budget development process, we have gathered information from a variety of sources, both inside and outside of the district, uh, from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed Education, the Missouri Association of School Business Officials, Jackson County Assessor and Collector, uh, James Moody, a former Director of Revenue for the State of Missouri, Stiefel, our bond broker, uh, the MASA lobbyist uh, in Jeff City, uh, the Raytown School District Administrators consisting of the Superintendent's Leadership Team, the District Leadership Team, uh, Activities Directors and Coordinators, uh, Academic Coordinators, uh, Ray Team as a body, 
uh, the supervisor of finance and payroll, and then of course the technology staff, which helps us in our payroll and benefits projections. Additionally, uh, we have sought out feedback and input from the finance committee and the board as a whole through surveys and conversations. Uh, based on the information that we've gathered, the uh, FY22 budget is designed to support efforts to achieve the goals set by the board. Those goals are found on page one of the budget document. Uh, Melissa, if you would turn to page one. Thank you very much. Uh, if you look at page one of this document, uh, and first let me just say the reason I'm, uh, I'm basing this presentation on this document because I want to drive your attention to this document. Um, additionally, hopefully you've received this in the mail this week at home, a hard copy of this uh, so that you could peruse through it. Um, the document is designed to provide you information you may to either approve, amend, adjust, or revise the, the proposed budget. Uh, but on page one, you'll notice the board goals. Those goals consist of increasing student achievement, creating and maintaining a culture uh, that values uh, the school community, uh, strive to become a district of choice in the metropolitan area, and assure a clean and safe environment. Uh, specifically, though, the, the the FY22 budget has been designed to add $2,000 to the base of the teacher salary schedule and a corresponding 6.3 5.631% increase to all salary schedules. Additionally, it maintains the benefits offered by the district, funds the recovery plan, and the continuation of virtual learning opportunities. The, this budget allocates debt service payments to meet the district's obligations. Finally, the FY22 budget allocates resources to address capital improvements through bond projects as well as unrestricted capital improvement projects. The general summary uh, of the FY22 budget begins on page eight. Melissa, if you would turn to page eight of the budget document and outlines a budget that ends uh, the FY22 school year with a uh, balance of 22.26% in unrestricted operating revenues or 26.8 million. Uh, this budget ends FY22 with 8.2 million in debt service revenues and finally 17.2 million in capital reserves. Uh, and of that 17.2 million, 10.6 million of those reserves are in unrestricted, I'm sorry, are restricted to bond projects. Uh, on page 12 through 19, Melissa, if you would please turn to pages 9 through 12, 12 through 19, uh, you'll notice some pie graphs and charts. Uh, you can see um, uh, how the revenues break down, how the expenditures break down by budget category, and those are there for your perusal. Uh, Melissa, if you would per please turn to page 26. On page 26 of this document uh, provides details of the accounts of revenues by object, as well as expenditures and functions. So on page 26, you'll see the section that begins with the revenues by object. Uh, Melissa, if you would please turn to page 31. You'll see expenditures by fund and object. And then on page 36, if you would turn to page 36, Melissa, you'll see expenditures um, by fund and object or fund and function. Additionally, on page 44 and 45, you'll notice the debt service payment schedule is provided. This budget document meets all of the legal obligations that uh, are required by the state of Missouri for a budget document. As we continue uh, the budget document process, uh, we will continue to refine the budget. A large portion of that refinement will be in the areas of title allocation, Perkins allocation, enhancement grants, staffing updates, capital projects, as well as we wrap up the FY21 year, uh, it'll help us start the, 20, the FY22 year. The budget adopted, uh, which is the last step of the budget process, will be brought to the Finance Committee in June and to the whole board at the June 28th budget hearing. Uh, thank you, and do you have any questions? 
Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions, Dr. Shelton. Yes, can sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Make sure you can hear me. Um, yes. The, uh, the, the document um, has the word um, budget approved throughout the document. I assume that um, I mean, we, we, I don't remember that we approved any budget yet. Is this more of a preliminary budget subject to a discussion uh, in June? Did I say that right? Yeah, yes, you did, sir. Yes, and by no means is this to indicate a budget that's been approved by the by the board. In the in the budget process, um, those three steps, those three phases exist. Uh, it just so happens that we are in the budget approved phase. Uh, the 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 final budget adopted phase is the one where the board has actually adopted and officially approved the budget for the FY22 year. So by no okay. by no means, it's just nomenclature that's used in the budget development process. Yeah, and I, I think uh, you know I got it on Thursday, and uh, which is I, I think you did a great job on the on the document, uh, and your team did a great job. But and I, but I do want. To, I probably will send some notes on questions um, Please do. that I think are appropriate when you examine a, a budget uh, using other people's money. So um, I'll, I'll do that within the next week and then we can talk about it in June. But I did have, a, I did want to follow up. I, I, I sent you and Dr. Markley a few emails um, uh, last month and, and I, want to, I want to probe something that I think you, you said um, I heard you say this, uh, this unrestricted capital projects balance. And I, I'd point out if you can open it to, uh, to uh, page nine, um, where it says under, under fund four, and I think this is important for the board to, to, to pick up on this because it does, um, it, it does uh, it, it impact the capital projects that we will do outside of the bond projects that we have uh, just completed. Uh, do you, you follow where I'm at? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Page um, nine? Okay. Yes, sir. Now, I saw in your, uh, your finance committee minutes that uh, the statement that we had um, ended our bond projects. At the end of our bond projects, we'll have roughly $4 million uh, available. Is that, did I, did I get that right? I, I believe that to be the case. That's what we're estimating. So, so in the in the bond offering, um, not to get too deep in the weeds, but the bond offering says we'll spend thirty-seven million dollars. We told we told the um, the uh, public that uh, we gave them a list of the schools that we're going to spend uh, money on. We gave them a list of the projects within the schools that we're going to spend money on. So we gave them a project list. It, it, did I say that right? Uh, yes, sir. So, what what you what you're saying is that the the four million dollars uh, is money that we 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 finished the projects and we came in under budget. Under we came in under the the bond proceeds. We we have four million dollars left over from um, of bond proceeds after the work is done. So yes. After after the projects were were com, were completed, we have we have, we'll have four million left, and it and that four million, it, again, it's detailed. Go to it, on page nine. If you look at fund four, it's it's probably the difference between nine million and three point five million. It's in that number. We we actually have a total of five point five million of unrestricted capital project uh, balances. Is, is is that number correct? It's uh, roughly correct. So, and, and, and I just want to go back to a, uh, a statement that, that you asked. You know, we, we have over, we have around $200 million worth of facility needs. And so um, to say that we've completed all of our bond projects, it, you know, we, we've completed the ones that we put on the project list. And so there are other projects beyond that project list that need to be completed. Um, and so uh, that, so to say that we've ended all of our bond projects, I, I, it, it, we, we will have done the bond projects that we listed at that time. We still have remaining bond, we still have remaining facility needs that we need to address. Well, 
Oh, and I, I, I completely understand that. Okay. But the, the offering document uh, stated that um, stated the projects, the amount of money, and so forth. And when we finish all that work, we're going to have four million, four million left over on the projects that were cited in the bond offering. Well, the is bond that right? Off, well, no, the bond offering it does it does specifically list some projects, but it goes on to say in a more general terms, facility improvement, general upkeep, general maintenance, and so there there are um, there's a broader there's a broader expectation in that language that we will use those funds for um, not just those projects, but we can use them. We can use them for uh, any any projects that meet the definition that's outlined in that in that language. And me, you're certain of that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm positive of that, yes. Let me well, I, I, I would only I would only ask though that I think, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I am a, a finance CPA and and I and I um, I looked in the in our policies, and it, and there's a it, our policies say that we uh, refer to the Missouri Financial Accounting Manual to determine um, uh, how we're going to account for bond transactions. The Missouri Accounting Financial the Missouri Financial Accounting Model uh, Manual says that um, amounts remaining in bond proceeds accounts after the completion of a project for which bonds were issued shall be transferred from the capital projects funds to the debt service funds. And it refers to um, section 165.011, which is, Missouri, is the Missouri statute. And if you go to the Missouri statute, um, it reads, uh, if a balance remains in the bond proceeds after completion of the project for which the bonds were issued, the balance shall be transferred from incidental or capital project funds, which is fund four, to the debt service fund. Now, you know, I, I, I understand, I understand your commitment to your view, but I'm having trouble reconciling that to what I read in the accounting and finance manual and to what I read in Missouri in Missouri law. I think in order to, to satisfy both of us, I, I think we're gonna need to get a, an unbiased um, uh, attorney here to read this statue and tell us whether you know, you're right that we have 5.5 million that we can go spend on projects that were not identified in the bond offering. And, and so, I think the, the essential element here is, again, we're dealing with other people's money. And the fact that we came in under budget, I think fits the finance manual. I think it fits the law. And I think we need to be careful if, we, if we've done it in the past, I don't know what, you, but I think we need to be very careful going forward as to whether or not we can spend that money on something that might generally relate to the projects that we specified in the bond offering, because that's a legal, that's a commitment to the public. So I would hope that before uh, June, we can decide um, the, the council to give us some insight on. Does that make sense to you? It makes, let me jump in here, Mr. Toad, sure. Ms. Allen. Sure. Um, you know, I think one thing we need to consider is we're not done with this, this length of projects yet we still have projects to bid we still have bonds to sell uh and, and projects that need to be completed over the next couple of years so we're we're saying four million okay we've saved so far uh i don't know if you've noticed but uh, some of our counterparts that passed bond issues in the this past april they're seeing steel prices that have doubled they've seen construction materials that have tripled uh we anticipate that's probably going to happen to us in the in the coming months and, and year that we have to bid projects so that four million dollar number that's what it is today it may not be that down the road now to answer your other question i think we can probably get with bond council uh that help help write the bond language to give us their uh, uh legal opinion on what we can or can't use that money on once those projects are done and i think that would well and, and, I, and I just, and I appreciate that, but I just heard from Dr. Shelton that the projects were done. And I think the other party that we need to, I mean, this is serious business here. And I think the other party that should be involved is the Department of Education who wrote the manual. 
I think that's the first place to start. And I, and I, I think that they, hey, Rick. It, yeah, I think that, I think there's a very real possibility that they might say, you got to follow the bond offering language, but I, I'm willing to, I mean, I think we need, we need some assistance on this before we go spend that money. I think before we could go in assistance, uh, it would probably be a decision for the entire board. Well, I agree. I mean, I, it, it, it may take a vote, but I think the vote, the board should probably have the should have the benefit of understanding what is in the manual, what is in the policy, what is in the manual, and what is in the law. And then I think they would be educated to make the decision. I don't think we, I don't think we're ready to make that decision, but I wouldn't want to go spend that money until we've had that that clarification. Well, I think, is that? I think what we can also give the board is a list of projects that have not been completed, that were promised to be completed in the 2019 bond issue. They have not all been completed. To the ones that we have to this point that are, are finished, and Dr. Shelton, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, we still have more projects that are going to occur uh, in next summer and possibly the summer after that. That That is correct, Dr. Markley. Actually, if you go to Paige. Um, uh, real quick, what what is it? What did you mean by we were, does the bond projects were completed? What did that statement even mean? If we still have projects so what, 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 that are what, on the list. Yeah, so what we have, we have a number of projects to complete. Uh, and so in those document, those, the, the upcoming projects are listed within the document. Um, what, what Mr. Toad is referring to is uh, the cash flow analysis that I've provided to the finance committee that um, based on the number of projects that we have planned and the estimated cost based on uh, the current balances, based on what we will sell uh, this spring and the anticipated premium associated with that, um, I project I project that we will have $4 million in balances at the end of that time. The, the caveat with that is Dr. Merkley, as he uh, alluded to, uh, steel prices, uh, all prices are, are going up drastically. And so that 4 million could be 1 million. Um, that 4 million could be a deficit of a million that we have to make up with our unrestricted uh, capital funds. Uh, so um, that, Mr. Mr. President, that's what I was referring to. At the end of all of this, my cash flow analysis as of today, and I'm talking we're two or three years out from that, from that end date, is that we will have $4 million in balances that we can continue the projects that we have on our facility needs assessment that is written into the, the bond language. Mr. President, I'm totally fine if uh, Shelly or any of our council or bond funds, Stifa wants to give us an opinion on this because I'm totally confident in what we've done in the past and what we're planning on doing in the future as far as any savings from bonds funds. What we've done in the past and what every school district in the state has done. So I'm totally okay if we get an opinion on that because I'm sure we'll validate what we have done and what we will continue to do. You have bond council that was part of the initial, um, am I unmuted? Uh, part of the initial um, I issuance that should be able to give you a quick, easy opinion on that. Um, Dr. Monses also at um, DESE has been through the same exercise in his capacity as a superintendent, and I'm sure could provide quick confirmation as well. For yeah, well, well, why don't we just get, we'll get DESE on the phone and see what they say, and then that would, that would we know what they have to say, and then we can get the council on the phone, and we can wrap it up, but I don't, I don't think I think it's appropriate to be cautious when we when we say we've got this money and we're going to use it on other projects, and that's why I'm pointing it out. That's I think that's a responsibility of the board. I think I have two questions, but first, uh, Mr. Toady, I would say that would probably have to be a motion that you would have to make and to get seconded. Uh, well, uh, we I, we're not adopting any budget right now. We're simply clarifying the accounting that we put in place. And we well, have to file financial statements and we have to sign off on them. So um, I, I don't know that I'm, I'm ready to move that this is right or wrong until no, I, I mean until a motion for you, you decided to, to get uh, counsel outside of what's been suggested. 
Well, I, I don't, if you want to get counsel, that's fine. I, I, I'm looking for factual information that close what I'm reading in the policy and in the law. And, and um, if you, you, know, you make a motion or not, or we can just pick up the phone and call Desi and see what they say. I Anybody think, can do that. Well, let me ask Dr. Sheldon, can you clarify for me uh, the diff how does bond funds become unrestricted or uh, restricted? How do, how, do we, how do we get to that class? Case? Sure. So um, fun, funds can be either unrestricted or restricted. And there are a couple of other classifications for funds as well, but that, those are the most two most common. When funds are restricted, they have to be used for a specific purpose. In this case, when we're talking about bond funds, those must be used for bond projects that are outlined in the language. And we've talked about that language, you know, uh, that they can be used for general upkeep and maintenance of facilities. Uh, and there are times in that bond language we do speci specify some of those specific projects. Um, but unrestricted capital, in this case, unrestricted capital uh, funds can be used for any capital projects, whether they're listed within um, uh, the bond documents or not. So uh, much, much more leeway with those bonds. So, additionally, additionally uh, if, if and when uh, the district ever had the opportunity to transfer funds from fund four to fund one, they could do that with unrestricted capital funds. They could not do that with bond proceeds. So uh, there is- So there's no unrestricted bond funds. There is, there are no unrestricted bonds. Okay, that's what I, I, yes. I, I guess I was throwing that word in there. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I think that's a helpful point because if I read our policy, if I read the finance manual, it would say that those monies that are not earmarked for, a, for the bond, if the projects have been completed, we call them unrestricted. DESE calls them unspent funds. Unspent funds, according to DESE and according to the law, and according to our policy, I think it says they should be sent back to the, to the debt fund. But I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm well enough. I'm, I may be wrong, but I think we ought to clarify that. But uh, I think he just fair? said unspent funds are not the same as unrestricted bond, unrestricted funds. That's not the same thing. I'm sorry. He just said that um, unrestricted funds are not the same as un spent bond funds they're not the same thing what, what are they then if there's restricted the, the balance is unrestricted and it's unspent so i'm i guess i'm trying to I'm, I'm quibbling what are they if they're not the same the question so, i think is uh, i can give carrie monsey's a call tomorrow at desi uh and at the same time we'll also ask later um now they're gilmore and bell uh, who is our bond counsel, we'll ask them to give an opinion on the things that you asked, Mr. Toady, with a phone call. That's fine. And I'd like to be on that call if I can with Desi, please. I'll see if I can schedule that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Toady. Any, any uh, additional questions from any other board members? All right. As I stated uh, at the June uh, Finance Committee meeting. We'll bring the next version of this document uh, to the Finance Committee and to the entire board at the June 28th uh, budget. I hearing. did have one other question. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Markley, you, did you say we still to sell some bonds? We still have bonds to sell, yes. That's the number. About 15.1 million. Yeah. And then, an addition, then anticipating an additional $2 million in premium on top of that. And those are for the the projects we've currently listed. So yeah, with, within that bond language, there's those projects uh, as well as this the once again the general upkeep maintenance of our facilities. Yes. And that was just part of the our regular schedule. Huh. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Markley, would you share with the board your results from your meetings? I will. Thank you. I'll get a copy of a letter from uh, our bond council. Thank you. 
Dr. Shelton, I had one quick question too. So in this document that you mailed us, the bond projects for 2021 and 2022 are there, but like like the Raytown Middle, um, some of their upgrades were scheduled for 2024. We're still planning on those, correct? It's just that oh, they're not in this fiscal year? That's correct. So um, if you look at the 2021 and 2022 list of projects, uh, about um, two two thirds will be of the 21 projects will be paid out of the 22 budget. Uh, there's always overlap, and about one third of the 22 projects will be paid for out of the FY22 project. So, uh, majority of the 21 projects will be done this summer and next fall, next year, uh, and then next spring. Uh, the 22 projects will begin and some of those pay applications will be taken out of this fiscal year, uh, out of the FY22 fiscal year. So about two thirds of the 22, 21 projects and about one third of the 22 projects will come out of the FY22 budget. Thanks. That's what I was thinking. I just wanted to clarify. In, in regards to the uh, unspent bond funds or the projection of if those funds are moved to other funds how would how would that decision be made well first of all we 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 because they're restricted they have to stay in fund four and so okay. they, they can only be spent on capital projects uh to mr toady's point um uh, you know those there there is language that says those funds can be uh transferred to debt service fund and be used to pay down debt I guess I meant, I'm sorry, I meant the unrestricted fund. Okay. So, of funds. Okay. So the unrestricted funds, if our, if our, if our, un, if our, so I'm going to, going to be very cautious here with my wording. Um, if our unrestricted operating balances, so I'm not talking capital money here, now I'm talking operating money. If our unrestricted operating balances drops below 20%, Right now, they're about 26%. If they drop below 20%, we can transfer funds from fund four to fund one. And that would, those funds could be, those funds that would be transferred would be unrestricted capital funds. Uh, that, that is the only option to transfer unrestricted capital funds from fund four is into fund one for the purpose of uh, you know, using for operating expenses. So no, no other reason. Yeah, and just to be clear, we're not even discussing doing that. Oh, we, and, and we're not eligible to. Yeah, we're not. We're not eligible to because our, our operating balances are not below twenty percent. I'm, I'm. I wasn't trying to. Sure. Say that, but I just. Sure. Yeah. That that is a great question, though. All right. A any other questions? Thank you. I appreciate the questions. Okay. Mr. Dr. President, I don't have a question, but I have a concern. And uh, Mr. Toady, I think you brought up a lot of good points and questions and concerns about what is and what isn't. My concern as a board member and any of us as board members, when we share our concerns and we want some answers, but then we tell our administrators where to go get those answers. And then we say, and by the way, when you do that, I'm gonna be involved with it. Uh, as a board member, I have a little concern about that. And I don't necessarily want a response. I just wanted to share that concern. I think uh, there's a lot of ways that they can go find these answers and we need to leave it up to them. And then I do as, as um, Bobby said, will you give us a report back from when you what you find out? I think that's very appro appropriate and something we should expect. But I have, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Mr. Landers, I'm just going to comment on your comment because I disagree with you there in the sense of a board member not attending the meeting. I think that is perfectly fine for a board member to attend. I mean, if they got questions and they want answers to them, those questions. It's important that we get our stuff to write. It's not saying anything negative about no administrator, but here's the thing. 
We know districts that have gone in, into situations that has been a bad report for them. And that's all I think Mr. Toti is trying to say, let's do it right. You might know it's right, but you want to make sure your board members know that it's right too. So that's my comment on your comment. And thank you, Bobby. I respect that too. And I'd like to, I'd like to comment, uh, Mr. Landers, you know, I have deep respect for you and your experience on this board. Um, what is at least as important to me as anything is that we are the custodian of public funds. And I pointed out some language here in our policy, um, in the finance manual prepared by DESE and under Missouri law, and they're all consistent. So I think it's important as the, the board, the custodian of the funds, to take an interest in hearing the discussion that takes place to make sure that all the facts are considered so that we render the appropriate judgment as to whether we are properly caring for the funds that the public has, has bestowed upon us. And I think you would probably agree with that. It may be unusual for a board member to, to participate, but it doesn't mean it's not essential. And Mr. Toady, your experience and your expertise in, in the field of finance, I respect tremendously. And I think your questions were very appropriate and the answers we need to find out is just, I shared my concern about that and, and uh, but I thank you for your policy uh, update and your concern with what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, I would like that. I appreciate the, the passion and I appreciate the comments that were made. I think this subject, as far as the budget, the budget is probably the most important thing that we can decide on as board members. And uh, we all definitely need to make our comments, but I think we also got to realize that it's going to take all of us um, as far as board members and administrators to, to do what we all want to do. And that's to uh, improve student achievement and, and do what's right for our students and their families. And so um, I encourage that, but I, I want to make, sure that I understand what you're saying, Mr. Landers, because sometimes if it gives the appearance that we don't trust each other. And that's something we we should build. And uh, we also should have a discussion, in-depth discussion about these things, especially with something as serious as this, because just like he said in this document, um, our goals, our goals is what this document is uh, is built on. And so we can't achieve our goals if we don't put the, the, our, our budget, our finances in the right place. And so uh, I appreciate everybody uh, doing that. And then we let's all just do it in the spirit of unity and working together. Mr. President, I just wanted to actually echo you in um, the thoughts that have been expressed and the concern and the passion. I do agree with um, board member Thody that we are the custodians and we must be vigilant in our role and responsibility. We must also be vigilant in our role and responsibility of governance. Um, so I appreciate what board member Lander said because we never want to interfere um with our role in governance thank you very much all right continue okay all right items uh number 6.7 6.8 dr huff do you want to bring us up to speed any questions that you might have for him over the virtual learning handbooks and secondary student planner information I, I can't hear anything he's saying. Can't hear you. Is that any better? Yes. All right. My, my, I had the wrong microphone on. 
All right, so <laughs> I'm surprised you knew I was saying anything at all. Uh, I did Holly. <laughs> any rate, uh, the virtual <laughs> learning handbooks are uh, a reflection of our anticipation of having some virtual learning classes for next year. However, it is enrollment, enrollment dependent and we are seeing a lower uh, enrollment than we were anticipating even a month ago. Some parents are backing out from wanting to do enrollment of their students in, in virtual learning. Uh, you can anticipate that we would have virtual learning courses. We'll have virtual learning opportunities uh, for our students no matter what, but it may not be our, uh, our staff that holds them if we don't have enough numbers. Uh, we will partner with an outside vendor, uh, Fuel Ed or Launch, and uh, we'll use this handbook if we do have in-person, or uh, I'm sorry, virtual learning classes that are taught by our own, our own staff. That is a, a, lot, a more likely possibility in elementary than in secondary. Any questions for Dr. Huff? Okay, 6.9 marketing communication plan. Uh, Ms. Nixon, are you out there? I'm gonna bring the board up to speed a little bit where we're headed. I am, good evening. Um, in this, we have a timeline. Melissa, can you go ahead and open up that timeline document? Last month, the board approved our managed project and so that first document is of the managed project timeline just to get the board updated on where we are headed. This month, we are going to um, release our survey. So we're working on the development of the survey. We're working on finalizing the questions so that we can get those surveys out. Um, hopefully by the end of this week, we wanna get them translated um, for our families and, and get those out so we can give our students at least two weeks time to fill out the survey and then staff and families at least three weeks time uh, to fill out those surveys. Um, in September and October, we will have um, feedback from family exit surveys and we will start hosting focus groups, including stakeholders that are students, staff, families, and patrons. In November, uh, K-12 Insight, that's the company that we approved to host our managed project, will do um, different workshops with district leaders, administrators, and they call that the making feedback matter. So they'll go in depth in the results of the surveys, in depth in the results of the focus groups so that we can then ultimately form um, what would be our marketing and communication plan moving forward. Um, and then in April of 2022, we will have those survey results. Um, we will have a second survey and that way we can have the baseline data from this year's survey and compare it to next year's survey and continue to do that um, on an annual basis or as um, we, we, in, we decide is appropriate moving forward. Um, and the other attachments on that agenda item are just the survey questions. And like I said, um, we have some tweaking that we need to do to those questions. They're still in progress, but our goal is to get those out by the end of this week. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you, Danielle. And I might also add that next month you will see in a consent agenda an RFP to engage with a strategic planning facilitator outside of the district. Uh, in the mid to late summer. Hopefully we can have that uh, ready to go as we bring all these plans together uh, to engage our community and how all that's going to look and give us a, a roadmap and a blueprint to where we wanna be. Okay. 6.10 is your 21-22 board meeting and PTA or council meeting dates. Rachel has those there for you. Any questions on those, concerns? Summer school, uh, let me jump in here and there's gonna be other people adding to this. We've got a couple motions that we want you to consider. First, let me begin by giving you a uh, update on the county and the city orders. As of the 30th of April, there are no more social distancing requirements in our classrooms or our lunchrooms. Uh, we can be at full capacity uh, the same way on the buses as long as we are wearing masks. There is still a mask requirement on the indoors. Outdoor recess, uh, currently we do not have a mask requirement. Students can wear them if they want to. Same way with outdoor PE. Now, as we come into summer school, we would recommend that the board approve and follow those Kansas City, Missouri, Jackson County COVID-19 orders issued on April the 30th. And so we can get as many kids into our, our buildings as we can, as long as we are following the order as presented. So that would be the first motion that you see.
Now, I'll start over, Mr. President. I move we adopt the April 30, 2021 Jackson County and Kansas City, Missouri guidelines for COVID restrictions suggested by the CDC for summer school. Second. Motion has been made and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, also on a caveat, let me make sure I'm... The caveat there is we anticipate a new order potentially being uh, released at the end of this month that may release even more restrictions. If it does, we will follow those according to the county and the city. And if there are restrictions added, we will do the same if it happens prior to uh, the board being able to meet. Okay. Okay. The second item has to do with staffing in summer school. Uh, when we set out to hire folks, and I'll, I don't know if Rachel, can you pull up that share that uh, we're going to ask the board to approve a salary schedule uh, difference this year because when we went to to find people to work uh, we were having a hard time finding particularly teachers um, teachers nurses and a few other pivotal pivotal spots and we found the reason that was occurring is because of what we were offering as pay currently the teachers in the district make 26 dollars an hour to teach summer school. That is equivalent to a starting teacher's pay, hourly rate of pay. The average pay around us is in the neighborhood of 30 to $35. Uh, if you look down at nurses, uh, our nurses, uh, you can see that uh, we're asking to raise their pay from 1745 to 30. Those are the two big ones uh, because outside industry are taking our nurses away from us during the summer when they're not on contract with us and we have to have those nurses. Same thing is occurring with districts around us. So along with this salary schedule, you also see that we're asking that all classified staff that are working summer school, that we go ahead and give them the percentage increase on their hourly rate of pay for the summer. They would be getting that in 2022 summer, but we're asking you to do it prior to that. So that would be uh, an increase for them as well. All right. Someone want to make that motion, Mr. President? I move the district approve summer school 2021 summer learning academy 2021 salaries as presented. Second. Motion been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, Mr. President, I believe you want to address 6.12. Yeah, as I as I mentioned earlier, um, I'll be sending out an email to you guys in regards to uh, uh, just uh, I'm gonna try to put together a survey like what uh, Dr. Shelton did is for us for us to answer uh, so he could put together our our budget document. Uh, I want to try to do the same uh, to initiate. Uh, writing our board goals and using that as a draft and just get all of us involved and just uh, you guys can I'll, I'll email it individually to everybody as not to constitute a board meeting and I won't I'll just and I'll I'll draft something up from from the responses also uh, I'll put something in there in regards to uh, our our committee uh, assignments and uh, just wanted, to, I know last year we didn't get to do it because we had a goal of reopening. And so I'm looking forward to that happening. And, and so, uh, but this year we, we can uh, make sure that we, you know, renew our goals and we all on the same page and we all have that input. I think uh, before I was anxious to be part of drafting those goals before with uh, knowing what I know now. <laughs> I think uh, we all can start out doing it together. So that's all I had on that. Well, I have Mr. President. All right. So next we have, did you know? Thank you. Danielle. Hi, 
so on Did You Know uh, this month, we have uh, congratulations to Raytown High School and Raytown South High School students who qualified for the National Speech and Debate uh, Association tournament, which will take place in June 2021. The tournament will take virtual will take place virtually this year, and we have talking Blue Jays who qualified: uh, Riley Harris, Judy Batts, Presley Stewart, Sean Holland, and Tochi. I'm going to ruin that last name. I completely apologize. Um, I think it's Ikonoa. Um, Raytown South High students who qualified are Brianna Bonner and Trinity House. FBLA, National FBLA, we have a Raytown High student, Brooklyn Jenkins, who placed fifth in the Missouri FBLA networking infra infrastructure event and qualifies for the virtual National FBLA competition in June. We have a former Cardinal who was drafted into the NFL, Jabril Cox, was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys in the first round of the NFL draft. During his time as a Cardinal, he was a three-sport athlete. He played football, basketball, and track. He is the highest uh, NFL draft pick from Raytown South High and the third Cardinal to be selected to play in the NFL. We have nine students in the district who earned the Distingu Distinguished Missouri Seal of Biliteracy. And those students um, had to, and they were proficient in Spanish. In order to achieve it, they must have complete five years of Spanish, create a portfolio and pass an assessment test. Raytown School District students uh, to achieve their seal uh, from Raytown High School include Madison Berry, um, and, sorry, <laughs> Amila, I think, Chavez Flores, Rihanna Ellis, Jonathan Martinez, Deja Chipo, Chipo, sorry, I'm so sorry, students, Ashley Spears, Presley Stewart, um, Katie, and then from Raytown High School, we have Ashley Rodriguez Vargas. You have a photo here from Northwood's graduation celebration, which recently took place. Um, they were able to have their celebration in the beautiful new Raytown High School auditorium. And then we have photos from Raytown Success Academy's uh, senior celebration, and those students will graduate at the two high school graduations taking place um, this Sunday, their ticketed graduations that are going to take place Sunday um, morning and afternoon. And that's Did You Know? Thank you, Danielle. Uh, next, we'll have uh, board committee reports, uh, finance committee. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Finance Committee met in April. Uh, what you have before you uh, are the approved uh, minutes from our February meeting and then the uh, tentative uh, minutes from the April meeting. Um, additionally, I uh, want to bring to your attention the audit dates. Um, we have the preliminary audit set for uh, early June and then the final audit set for uh, mid to late September. I just wanna remind all board members, you have the opportunity to meet with the auditor individually or collectively um, and would encourage you to do that. Uh, actually, we will send out an email around that time uh, requesting, um, uh, asking if you're requesting a meeting, we can schedule that for you. But um, at any time, if you'd like to meet with the auditor, we would encourage you and welcome you to do that. Also on this agenda item, uh, you'll notice the uh, financial forecast and uh, just there for your perusal um, as we uh, obviously are in this budget uh, planning time. It's important for you to keep that in front of you as well. Uh, what we are asking you to do tonight though is to approve the February 8th uh, Finance Committee minutes. And that's all I have. Mr. President. I move to accept the February 8, 2021 Finance Committee minutes. I second. Uh, motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, next on the agenda is that community, com community, committee membership and structure. Uh, you guys will get more information on that. Uh, I'm going to try to do that pretty quickly. So we won't hold any. Uh, body up as far as uh, being on those committees. And so we'll do those pretty quickly. And uh, next we'll move to the consent agenda. 
Mr. President, I move that the board approve the May 10, 2021 consent agenda as presented. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes right, have it. Motion carries. Uh, I'd like to read the donations uh, that were made this month. Uh, first, we have donation of $30 to Robertson Elementary School for fundraising efforts from Mr. and Mrs. Straits. We have a donation of $100 to Raytown South High School baseball uniforms and equipment from Mr. and Mrs. Summers. We have a donation of $150 to Race Town South High School baseball uniforms and equipment from Mrs. Crystal Ross, Rouse. Uh, donation of $50 uh, from uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lodgerman um, for baseball uniforms and equipment. We have a lot of, all of these are baseball uniform and equipment. So it's $200 from Mr. and Mrs. Judd. Um, $100 from Mr. Buford and Ms. Whit Whitworth. $400 from Mr. Kyle Reed. $100 from Mr. and Mrs. Fitzgerald. $100 from Mr. and Mrs. Summers. And $300 from Gold Company. And $250 from Bob Site Ford. And $700 to Laurel Hills uh, Elementary for school supplies from Amazon. We thank everyone who's made donation and we greatly appreciate it. That's uh, really good. Oh, it's one more down here. Uh, donation of $700 to Northfleet Elementary for school supplies also from Amazon. I wanna thank Mr. President, to all our donors. Mr. President, can I, can I ask a question? It'll be brief. This one will be brief. The, why, what is it, uh, Dr. Markley or Dr. Shelton, um, we've got the, these wonderful donations for the Raytown South High School baseball uniforms. Don't we provide uniforms and equipment for, for our baseball team? Why, and, and why is it, I mean, it's all Raytown South, but, but what, what's the story behind this? Well, let me, let me speak to a personal story and I'll give you the Raytown High version of that work since I'm the father yeah. of the baseball player. <laughs> Uh, we do provide the uniforms and uniforms are on a rotating basis. So they don't get new uniforms every year, but their uniforms are as current as two to three years at a time. But these things are extra money they want to raise. Everybody hear me? Okay. Extra money that they want to raise for pullovers or different types of warm up suits that they okay. make. So, okay. Yeah, I was going to. It's so beyond that, the basics, so to speak. It is. It is. Yeah, yeah it's okay. usually for extra stuff that makes us, the players feel good about themselves when they get off the bus and walk into opposing school. Okay. Okay. The backpacks, Thank you. Things like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next on to uh, unfinished business. Get a motion. Mr. Yeah, President. I move that the last day of school for employees in the following positions be changed to May 28, 2021. Teachers with 184 days contracts, instructional assistants, building clerks, social workers, library clerks, copy clerks, clinic aides, certified and classified ISS teachers, elementary counselors, interventionists. Additionally, I move that the last of school for food service and transportation employees in the following positions on 175 day calendar be changed to May 27th, 2021. Cooks, bakers, cafeteria managers, bus drivers, bus aides, and crossing guards. Second. Motion has been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Moving on to new business. We have a compensation study. Okay, I'll start this out and then I'll let the board jump in and take over. But uh, this is a compensation study that we had uh, that was born out of the finance committee several months ago. Um, it is the same study that we got back just prior to the April meeting, but the documents were endless. And Mr. Toady, uh, 
suggested that we probably give the board another month, which we certainly agreed. And I think the rest of the board did as well. And that month has come and gone. Uh, this is, we also said this was more of a board requested document, even though we think it's beneficial to all. So we wanted to throw it out there for board discussion before we gave our thoughts on it and who we might recommend. Does that sound, sound agreeable? Yeah. So open for discussion, any comments? I like that. I was hoping for your input, Dr. Markley, but anyway, I did like the, I think it's evergreen proposal. Yes, and we're gonna, we will give our input, but we want the board to have a discussion first. Okay. I know, but I was just saying, <laughs> okay. I wanted to hear yours. Okay. I, I support um, that point of view and what I read in the evergreen is that um well all of them except for cbiz had uh, very deep credentials uh, very deep industry credentials oddly enough cbiz was local but but if they had industry credentials they didn't present them and i think a lot of weight needs to go to industry credentials because you know people like to have someone as a consultant that knows their way around <laughs> their industry or otherwise people don't want to listen or communicate I mean, that's a that's a risk but i i thought also that the um maybe maybe bobby you could shed some light i thought the conversation that they documented on liberty was incredible um it was uh, concise it was uh it was deep it was thoughtful and it was uh more than i expected and i i i thought um Overwhelmingly, Evergreen was the was the winner. Um, yeah. The prices are are different, but I, I there was no tie in my mind. They were really good. Yeah, I really like that fact. Like you said, they they're in the industry, you know. And I would rather have somebody that's actually doing that, and somebody yeah. that got all these other multitudes of things doing, and just do that. As you know, I I don't think they got the the weight to make to move into uh, making decisions for. Uh, school districts because they don't have a lot of school district background. I agree with that. Anybody else? Any more comment? I just say I also <laughs> agree, made the same observations of Evergreen. Mr. President, you want a motion? Uh, you know, uh, we're going to hear what you want me to oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, Dr. I'm sorry. Markley. Yeah, I'd like to hear that. Absolutely. Um, I, I was in the grants and, and either, you know, MGT Evergreen EMS provided their, their uh, references and we've worked with EMS in the past. Uh, and the last time we had this done, uh, I think MGT uh, priced themselves out of it. I don't see what we can get that Evergreen could not give us you know, for we're talking a range of money here, seventy thousand right. uh, dollars, and you know that it, to me between the two, Evergreen and EMS, I think it could give us the same service, but Evergreen at a much better price. And if you look at the list of schools that Evergreen gives, right. as opposed to EMS, they're not even close. Right. So you know, even though we scored them all the same rubric, the rubric is kind of bland because it it's asked for specific. It didn't go to the specifics that you mentioned, Mr. Toady, you know, and giving us some of that real world feedback. Uh, yeah. Didn't ask for that, so you couldn't score it. You had to you had to tell it. Sometimes a story has to be told, and they told it. So we're comfortable with with either one, Evergreen or EMS. My Dr. Shelton, your grants. Yes, I am. And uh, in conversations with uh, Dr. DeVilbus, uh, who has done some uh, checking around Evergreen, came highly recommended. So, so is it fair to say that the um, embellishment that Evergreen gave themselves on the Liberty Project was authentic and realistic? I mean, sometimes we can all think we're really good in consulting projects and but did you get that kind of opinion from from the uh, the liberty people 
No, I don't think they're in Boston at all. And Dr. Tucker up there has worked with them. Who I, Dr. Tucker followed me at Rogersville, and I trust his opinion probably more than what Evergreens would be. And and he did not speak in any other way about them. So. Okay. Well, I think we can uh, make a motion. Mr. President, I move we hire Evergreen. I second. Motion been made and seconded to hire Evergreen for our compensation study. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. I think it's important we say also it's for the public that don't get to see these documents. It's much more than a compensation study. It's looking at job descriptions, job titles. Uh, if they're compensated at the market, they don't see that, wouldn't you say, board? I mean, that's mm -hmm. something that's important mm -hmm. to say. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll help us um, in, re in just re in our retention of yeah. staff. And well, 48,000 may seem like a lot of money because all you're tying it to is compensation, but so much more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should have said all of that too. You're right. I mean, I don't think, I think, I, th I don't think it's fair to say that we're doing anything wrong. I think it's fair to say they'll help us do things better and bring us up to speed, you know, on the, on the job descriptions. I think there needs to be some investment and we just don't have the hands to go do that right now. So um, yeah. I really think this is, I think you did a great job of picking these people and, and getting them in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and you. It's something that's really needed too. I mean, it's not like we don't need this. We really need it. All right. So let's go on to our change orders and uh, building upgrades and bond work. Mr. President. Yeah. I move the Board of Education approve change order in the amount of $150,215 to Royal Construction to increase the overall contingency on the 2021 building upgrades from $135,900 to $211,215 leaving $60,000 in contingency after the change order to Royal Constructions for the remainder of this project. Second. Can we get some discussion on that? Uh, Dr. Sheldon. Dr. Was. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and actually, I'm gonna ask Sandy to, uh, Cochran from Hollis and Miller to, to jump in here as well. But as she's coming onto the call, um, as we put the, uh, uh, plans and blueprints in front of the city. They came back and asked us to um, uh, upgrade the uh, entryways, the driveways into the parking lots from an asphalt material to a concrete material. Um, to make that adjustment from asphalt to uh, concrete is about a $20,000 increase in cost per site. And so um, we're doing a number of those entryways, those driveways into our parking lots. And so that cost uh, uh, went up to 150,000. The, um, uh, the amount of the contingency that we had set for these projects was 135. And so that consumed more than the contingency. Uh, we also know and realistically expect that there may be another $60,000 in, in, in needs of change orders uh, and other aspects of these upgrades. Um, so we want to be mindful that this these may not be the only change order so uh, uh, in a nutshell uh, it this is coming from the city and a change and that they want us to make from asphalt to concrete entryways into our parking lots is this uh, uh Dr. Ray Shelton. oh i'm sorry is this raytown or <coughs> kansas city uh this is kansas city missouri uh, already i'm oh, go ahead I'm sorry, Mr. President. And Dr. Shelton, this is a new requirement. This requirement was not in effect prior. I thought it was myself. Yes, th thank you for asking that. Sandy, are you on the call? Yes, I am. I am. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for ha having me on. It's good to see you all. Um, to answer your question, uh, Ms. Payton, yes, this was a prior requirement. However, this is something we have not um, been required to do from the city of Kansas City prior to um, this year. Uh, all of these drives were currently asphalt, um, have been maintained and improved before this date. 
and after they have upgraded these standards to asphalt, that this is something that this year they have decided to um, push at requiring. So there are a couple options in front of the district uh, in order to move forward. One is to, to pull back the scope of work from the property line inside and not um, maintain that entry point or to pull out all of the existing asphalt and change it to concrete. So one of the reasons we didn't include it in the original scope of work is one, it's, it's, it's an added cost, a substantial added cost to the district um, that does create added value. However, longevity wise, is it necessarily needed to be concrete? And from a design and uh, maintenance standpoint, we, it, it is not, but the Kansas City, Missouri is requiring it for all entry points off of public uh, streets. Oh, and I apologize. I just want clarity, Sandy, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. The uh, requirement was there, but it had not historically been um, required, for lack of a better term. Enforced. Enforced. Right. Thank you so much. But now, so we knew the requirement was there. We just didn't want to, and when I say we, I mean uh, the general contractors and Hollis and Miller did not want to. Um, give us that cost, what I'm not understanding. It's, it's our role as, um, as your consultant, as your, as your architect to um, help you uh, save funds that are creating added value to your projects. So if there's a requirement that is not typically enforced by a jurisdiction, um, if, we can, um, if we can maintain your properties without um, adding added value, or I'm sorry, without adding additional costs, but still giving you added value, um, then that's then that is what we will do. Um, one of the questions I think Mr. Burton started to bring up was it is in within the limits of Kansas City. However, it is under um, Raytown School District. So there are there are many standards that Kansas City, Missouri has that they don't necessarily enforce. Now is this and it also comes down to um, safety. So if it's something that impacts safety for properties or for the service of staff and students for the district, we'll absolutely include those and advise you to maintain those. But concrete um, drives from public streets into parking lots is not one that is actually adding safety to your properties. It's just a maintenance concern. But it does keep us in line with the law. Uh, it's not necessarily a law. It's just a standard under Kansas City, Missouri. It's not a building code. It's just a standard that they that they require under the city limits. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. Mm -hmm. Mr. President. Yeah. So Sandy, I'm I'm a little bit confused here. Are we talking about work that's being done on these driveways and we're bringing them up to standards or we're tearing out perfectly good driveways to put in these this concrete? They're not perfectly good. Um, we were showing asphalt improvements to those drives as part of this year's asphalt improvements to these locations. Okay, so that, that, that that's good enough. That answers my question. So we were planning on doing some improvements in these areas. It, they, Kansas City just didn't come along and tell us we got to put concrete entrances on our, all our drives. No, no, it's because we were showing maintenance. Now we okay. have run into this in a couple other districts this year um, that were also doing asphalt maintenance. Now, typically in the past, if it's considered maintenance, they've not required full replacement at these entry drives. This year they are. Um, other districts have pushed back and said, it's only maintenance. It's not a full depth replacement. Um, it's only an overlay. And Casey Mo has said, it doesn't matter whether it's maintenance or not. We are requiring you to pull out all asphalt and put in concrete. And what, what's their reasoning for that? It's part of their standards. Now, sometimes over the years, there are different standards that they, wear, they will push and um, um, inspect and, and require uh, be met. And then other years, there are different things. So as I said, I mean, it's is not it because, a code, Is it it's because the driveways tie in the storm drainage or something or? No, they're just, they just, uh, they're the aprons that lead to the public streets. All right, thank you. Sandy, um, did they review that before uh, we started with construction? I mean, I'm sure they approved. We haven't we... started yet. We haven't started yet. Oh, um, this is this part for, of the, oh, okay, okay. This is part of the permit review process oh, okay. uh, through KCMO. So, oh, okay, yeah. And as I stated, you know, pre previously to now, we have put in for maintenance repairs and have not have not been asked to create these updates, and so. As, as Ms. Payne was asking, you know, it's, our, it's our job as your consultant to create added value, keep your 
properties safe, but also to help you save costs. And if this is something that is not necessarily a need, then it's something we'll advise you to try to save costs on so you can spend money elsewhere. Right. Well, I, I agree that the concrete entrances do look nicer, but mm -hmm. it would be nice if they would also say why they're requiring this. What what actually purpose are they serving? Yeah, they've always, it's, it's more durable. They've always required it. They just didn't enforce it. That, and I would say, uh, Ms. Payton stole my question, so thank you. <laughs> but, so, all right. So the motion's been made and seconded. Is there any other discussion? All in now, favor? Be, oh. I'm sorry, before we take a vote, um, if Kansas City, Missouri is looking closer at things like this, for instance, asphalt and concrete when it comes to those entrances, Will we be seeing other change orders because of the same reason that they had standards that they were not enforcing? And when we go for a permit, do you foresee anything like that in the near future, Ms. Cochran? I don't anticipate any other any other enforcements like this in the future. Now, for next year, asphalt improvements, if we have um, entryways into public streets that are under KC Mo jurisdiction, we will show concrete um, in order to maintain that standard. Another concern I have, I understand and um, appreciate your company wanting to save the district money. We spoke at our last board meeting about that very same type of incident where we needed to save money and building a wall and then down the line, um, we've incurred additional costs. I mentioned that because the asphalt and the concrete, do we look at these when we're discussing and when we're planning them short term or long term? And if we're looking at long term, are we offered as a district options to choose from? And I just say that I'm not asking you to um, respond but I do appreciate you hearing out my comment. And hopefully in the future, if there are those types of choices, we'll be allowed to review them and make them. Sure, absolutely. Mr. President, a uh, point uh, perhaps it's worth noting or thinking about, do we have any political leverage here? Do we have uh, our city council person that might, um, have a conversation to find out if there's any wiggle room here, um, or are we do we just put that aside and comply? Well, there there is not a lot of wiggle room, Mr. Toady, um, and I say that because there, like I said, there have been some other di districts that we work with that have pushed back, back um, rather forcefully on this requirement, and KCMO did not budge. So. Um, our options were to, like I, like I stated previously, was to pull the scope of work back from the street um, and not include the apron in the maintenance um, or, to, or to include it. And those were literally our options. Now, before now, we've been grandfathered in under maintenance um, and those current asphalt drives. And this, like I said, this is something this year that they are starting to enforce. So the short answer is there's no advantage politically that we have here. I would say yes, not I don't think so. Not on something like this, probably. Okay. And I don't Thank know you. that we would want to use it for this. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. All right. Motion has been made and seconded. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. All right. Opposed? No. Motion passed. Aye. Let's go on to elementary math resource. In a motion. Mr. President, I move that the board approves McGraw Hill for the purchase of the elementary math resources in the amount of $587,514. Second. Motion has been made and second. Is there any discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. All right. Now we'll have entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. 
<laughs> Mr. Mr. President. <laughs> Go ahead. One at a time, please. <laughs> We're just yeah, excited. Beth, don't. <laughs> don't Mr. President, I move that the board adjourn the regular board meeting of edu Board of Education meeting at 7.54 p.m. Woohoo, second it. <laughs> <laughs> Motion made and second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting Mr. adjourned. President, Mr. President, I got to ask one more question. I'll be brief. Can someone tell me who like. the two... <laughs> Who the two Raytown South football players, the other two that Danielle mentioned, there were three in the NFL. And I'm looking at, at uh, Mr. Landers. Who were the other two besides Jabril Cox that played at Raytown South? I, Anybody I, know? Jason, Bel Jason Belcher. Jason Belt. That's a good one. I don't know. Uh, there was a huge lineman that played at KU, and I think he was drafted in, but I don't. He, I, I believe it's Limbo Parks. Yeah, Limbo, Limbo Parks. Parks. Okay, wow. Probably he's the third one. Went to, went, to, went to Arkansas. We wish we had him at KU, but he went to Arkansas. <laughs> That's some heavy trivia. Heavy trivia. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Meeting All right. adjourned. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye.